Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Ellen Shiner and um, we're happy to have you at this month's um, Lyceum, which is a free series of presentations. Uh, this morning, this afternoon's talk, sorry, is entitled Witness to Forgery and Bob Dowd is going to be our host. Um, and um, let me just give a little opening on Bob's bio. He's a technical marketing director in a cloud security field and has worked as an assistant to his father uh, during high school and college, which is uh, what he's going to be talking about today. Along with his spouse, Corinne, Bob has been a first parish member for 25 years and been active on numerous committees, including the parish board, finance co-chair, membership, information technology, and the building committee where he coordinated the 1999-2000 addition to the church. Um, this project um, uh, was um, a long awaited expansion of the church uh, public space. In his spare time, Bob enjoys working and mentoring middle and high school youth through various church programs and the Rotary's um, Youth Leadership Awards program. We hope you'll enjoy this presentation and take it away, Bob. Well, thank you so much, Ellen. And, and I'd like to just um, express my appreciation to you and for the other volunteers on the Lyceum Committee for uh, allowing these things to happen. It's a lot of work and uh, it's, a, it's a noble cause. So thank you, thank you. Is everyone able to see my screen? Maybe give a thumbs up. Is that showing up? Good, all right, wanted to make sure. All right, so um, just gonna stop sharing for one second uh, so I can see you all. Um, Again, I appreciate uh, being invited here to talk, and um, I can only imagine that some of you are thinking to yourself, forensic document examination, I don't even know what that is, and why am I here on this beautiful Sunday afternoon <laughs> listening to this talk? Well, hopefully um, we can make it interesting for you, and I'd like to um, bring up some examples of some current events where this topic may become a little bit more relevant once you, once you see this. So what an election season we've just had. Um, we, there's been claims of uh, voter election ballot fraud, uh, forged ballots by dead people, um, you know, the whole topic of comparing signatures from ballots to registration cards has been in the news. So this is something. And then um, maybe we all remember about three years ago in late 2017, there was a special election held down in Alabama. And it was um, regarding the illustrious Judge Roy Brown, or I'm sorry, Judge Roy Moore who was uh, an ousted George, uh, Alabama Supreme Court uh, justice who was running to take the seat uh, of um, Jeff Sessions, who Trump had just appointed to become the attorney general for, as it turns out, a relatively short time. And um, this uh, interesting character had uh, quite a, a lot of strong views on things, but also there were allegations that came up during this election cycle of um, sexual assault and other uh, impropriety with, with women. And one particular case made it into the news quite a bit of, a, at the time, a teenager who was familiar with uh, Roy, Roy Moore. And she worked at a diner as a waitress. And he would come in frequently and chat it up with her. She indicated he was always a little creepy. And uh, then apparently one night when she was closing up, uh, she alleges that uh, he assaulted her in, outside in the parking lot. And one of the things that came up in this allegation was, yes, a signature. And the fact that this guy apparently signed her yearbook, <laughs> which is an odd thing for an uh, adult man to do with a uh, waitress in a restaurant. But um, you can see here on CNN, there was a, a piece that I qu quickly grabbed my camera and screen captured 
of showing in the center there this signature in the yearbook, Roy Moore, district attorney at the time, and he dated it. And Old Hickory House was the, uh, the diner where, where this happened. And um, up above are what are called exemplar signatures, meaning these are known actual signatures of Roy Moore, uh, some of them around the same time, which it's always best to have signatures available that are in the same time range as the question one. And so anyway, uh, that's another current events or not, maybe not quite so current event situation where documents and signatures uh, became uh, an issue. Well, so why am I speaking with you today? Well, um, as, as uh, Ellen introduced, my father was a uh, document examiner in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He had a notable career for over 50 years. And I, Bob, his aspiring son, as well as my older brother before me, um, ended up, yes, here I am, uh, apprenticing with him or working for him during high school and college summers and other holiday times. I think maybe he imagined that someday it would become, his private practice would become Dowd and Son or Sons, but we each um, went off into different directions, uh, me in the case of uh, going off to computers and technology and my brother, uh, a minister in, in Michigan. So he never put undue pressure on us kids, but um, it was a fascinating thing to work with him. And of course, just as his, as his kids, we heard about the cases that he was involved in over the years around the dinner table. And so I'm gonna spend a little time today to give you a recount of some of the more interesting and fascinating cases that he was involved in. But before I do, a little clarification on this field of work that we're talking about today. So my father's work would sometimes be referred to as he was a handwriting expert. Well, that's not really a very precise term. There are two very different practices that could be referred to in that case. The first being um, graphology or being a graph graphologist. And this is the idea that we can discern people's personality or character traits or disposition or even physical attributes simply by looking at an example of their writing or a signature. Uh, interestingly, this is used in Europe, particularly France, uh, during hiring decisions. Uh, people are asked to submit a sample of their handwriting and then it's sent off and, uh, to a graph graphologist to determine if this person's character is suitable to be employed at the company. Well, we don't allow that in the US and, and um, I venture to say it probably doesn't belong in a court of law either. No doubt there are um, plenty of situations where a strong correlation can be drawn be be between somebody's signature or handwriting and their personality, but you know, correlations and having something admissible in court are, are, are different things. Forensic document examination, which is what my father was involved in, it's under the forensic sciences or police science. You can get university degrees in this uh, field with a specialization in documents. And uh, forensic soc document examiners are often called as, as expert witnesses in court uh, to provide testimony on, on civil or even uh, criminal cases. So in this field, um, the, the, uh, the expert leverages a lot of scientific principles, um, laboratory techniques. My father ran a practice, private practice and he had a, a small laboratory in his office where he could uh, examine documents under high magnification, special lighting techniques like uh, ele uh, electroluminescence and infrared photography and so on. The FBI, Secret Service, other government agencies employ uh, hundreds of forensic document examiners that are used on, you can imagine all sorts of cases from forging money and currency to, uh, to signatures and other, other things. But most uh, large cities also have one or more private practitioners, like my father was in Milwaukee, that attorneys will call upon to, to give them assistance on certain cases on behalf of their clients. Now, you know, the attorney could be representing a, a defendant um, or, or otherwise, and you know, the expert witness or the, the expert document examiner may rule in their favor or not. The document examiner is obliged to tell the facts and the truth of what they determine. It won't always align with what the attorney wants. And so in some cases, the document examiner would come up with a, 
a, a decision on a document and it wouldn't be favorable and the attorney would say thank you very much here's your here's your payment and that's all I need from you. Uh, they're not obliged, of course, to share that in court necessarily. And there's professional organizations. My father was a member of the American Society of Question Document Examiners, the uh, American Board of Forensic Document Examiners, and these uh, would hold conventions and conduct training amongst themselves and certifications. So um, how does one get into this field is a question I often hear. So back to my father, um, it was you know, a somewhat random occurrence, I think. He studied some science uh, classes at UCLA um, early in his life, uh, unfortunately con contracted tuberculosis and spent a year out of school uh, on his back, uh, recovering from that. Fortunately, he did, thankfully for me <laughs> and all of you here today that are joining me. And um, when he got back to it, he um, ended up just falling into an apprenticeship with um, a document examiner in the area. In addition, he had taken photography classes from the great Ansel Adams, who many of you have heard of. He's notable for his photographs out of uh, Yosemite and the very famous picture I've shown here on the screen of Half Dome. Um, so my father definitely had this interest in photography, started apprenticing with the document examiner and the rest is history. He, ended up going on to pursue 50 years in the field, uh, most of it in private practice in Milwaukee. So towards the end of his work life career and then into early retirement, Don, my father, wrote a, a memoir, a book of his more interesting cases and a little bit about the field. And it was titled Witness to Forgery. And here's my one pitch. You can get it on Amazon. And um, this book, uh, unfortunately, was not published before his, his passing in 2005, but the family marshaled together and my sister, for example, put, helped put together the cover for the book and I helped uh, assemble the, the inner contents and we got it out uh, uh, published. So um, it, it, uh, it was a great thing to see his work finally out there for others to see. So he covers more than a dozen of uh, notable cases in this book. And today I'm gonna just touch on a couple given the time that we have uh, that I think will be particularly interesting. So the first one I wanna talk about is regarding the, the last will and testament of yes, King Henry VIII, a figure that I hope we're all familiar with. King of England for 36 years, talk about uh, a dynasty from 1509 to 1547. He was well known for various things, uh, six wives and a few of them guillotined, I believe. <laughs> and he was uh, quite treacherous in his political uh, behavior. He would have people executed and, and yet he also uh, accomplished some very big things. I think he's uh, attributed for the creation of, of a significant Royal Navy because when he entered uh, his, uh, his dynasty, there was only a few ships in the Royal Navy and he built it out uh, magnificently. He also created a separation between the state and the Catholic Church, or the Church of England. And uh, that was uh, kind of a big deal at the time and certainly earned him plenty of enemies. But um, he became very sickly in his last few years. No surprise that he was around 55 years old. And, um, and yet he still ruled with an iron fist all the way to the end. Now, in the late 1960s, my father was called in because there were some questions regarding the will of King Henry VIII. Um, there was a will produced after, after he passed away. Um, and my father happened to be in, in Europe for a, a document convention where he was speaking. And so he was able to connect it together with this request that he uh, take a look at the will and the signature of King Henry VIII. And so he was able to go from this convention over to London and spend a few extra days um, examining this, this will in the Royal Archives in the um, Public Records Office. Remarkably, the original will of King Henry VIII, so 400 something years old, um, is still surviving and was able to be put on a table right there for my father to look at uh, live and in person. Now, it's worth noting that and, and this probably was typical of at the time that the will was not just about dispersing the king's money and perhaps his properties and other things. It was also about the line of succession to the throne. And so um, 
you know, a will like this would be very consequential in terms of who would be ruling um, in the bloodline following his, his passing. And King Henry VIII, in, in um, typical fashion, uh, made it quite controversial because in his will, he uh, designated not the typical bloodline succession, it went to the Suffolk descendants rather than the Stuart line, which would have been his older sister's line that would happen by default, but he redirected it to his younger sister's family line. So that was controversial in many years following his death. Um, in any case, so this will, it was really an addendum or a, rev a revision to an earlier will that was prepared in late December, 1546, he wouldn't have written the will himself. He would have had a scribe who was expert in, you know, the handwriting of the time, uh, actually do the drafting of the of the text. But of course, it would have come from his instructions. But it was drafted in December, but the king wouldn't sign it right away. And some speculated that he was just holding it as a sword over anyone's head who would try to do something in his final days. So it remained unsigned through December and into January, and he continued to de decline. Um, until he was on his deathbed on January 27th, 1547. Um, overnight, uh, he declined very rapidly and uh, his bedchambers were closed off. 11 of his closest confidants, a few doctors and other um, counselors were with him and he passed away in the morning of the 28th. And at that time was presented uh, the will, all signed. <laughs> and you can see the two signatures here on the screen on page one, which was typical of the time uh, people would sign the first page of official documents. Many of the King's documents were only signed on the first page. Um, you see his signature there in the upper corner with a red box around it. And then on the right is the 14th page of the will with his signature again, together with the 11 signatures of witnesses who were there in his bedchambers with him. So um, that, that's the backstory here to the will. And um, let's take a moment and go back to the beginning of the king's reign when he first came into office. Um, like some other monarchs and other aspiring monarchs that we know, he wasn't a big fan of paperwork. And so the king didn't much like signing documents all the time, I'm sure many days he had to sign multiple documents. And so he commissioned that a, what's called a dry stamp be prepared for him, which was a, a replica of his exact signature. That was, um, and this picture I have here is no doubt nothing like what the dry stamp was back in the 1500s. I couldn't find an image of that, but something like this, which would essentially um, emboss his signature onto the parchment or the paper. So you'd, you'd insert it and then push down hard and it would uh, create an embossment like, like a, a notary public seal or something like that onto the document of his signature, but no ink. That's why it's called a dry stamp. And then what would happen is um, a person charged with this task, one of his you know, trusted aides, would then take a pen and would fill in the grooves in the embossment probably using a, a side light to highlight the grooves and he would fill it in with ink. So there, there would be a little bit of variation in the net effect of this because, you know, depending on the skill of the practitioner of, of filling in those grooves, he might wander a little bit or go a little bit beyond. So it wasn't like you might imagine a typical, you know, rubber stamp where it's exact every time minus a little ink bleed. Um, so there was slight variation, but not much. Uh, really the shape and form and spacing and everything would be quite rigid. So this uh, dry stamp would have been securely stored in some kind of safe and only accessible to trusted people. There was a ledger that went along with it that, that it documented every time that uh, stamp was used to sign a document because, you know, this is important legal stuff. Um, and a, only a couple of counselors would be allowed access to this. Um, so that's a little bit of the backstory of, of this dry stamp. And of course, as you can imagine, there was some... Um, there was some question about whether this dry stamp might have been used on the will. And, uh, and so we proceed. So my father was called in and was sitting there in the Royal Archives uh, looking at this will and trying to discern whether in fact the signatures on page one and page 14 of the will were 
were hand drawn or were this dry stamp. And over on the right are some photographs my father took of the will signatures. Um, you can see two there, one from page one, one from page 14. And then uh, he was able in the archives to get his hands on uh, almost 100 examples of other documents, historical documents that were kept from the 1500s when this dry stamp was used and, and it was noted in the ledger. And so he had, they call them exemplars or examples of the dry stamp, King Henry VIII's signature. Those two are shown in the middle there. And then at the bottom is one example and he had many documents of hand-drawn uh, signatures of the king. And so one of the first things my father thought to do was, hey, let's look at this document under magnification and with lighting to see if I can discern the embossing of the dry stamp, because that would create a fairly a notable and discernible um, imprint in the actual fabric of the document, the paper, um, which wouldn't be typical of a handwritten. You know, remember in those days, they weren't ballpoint pens where you push fairly hard. They would have been, you know, ink quill pens that you know, just sort of leave the ink on the surface of the paper with minimal indentation. Well, when he went to look for this, uh, unfortunately, it, it really wasn't there. And it was a little perplexing at first because he sort of expected he might see uh, something like this. And he looked at some of these other examples and it wasn't there on those either. Well, it <laughs> turns out that over the hundreds of years, they had performed some preservation work on the will and other documents. And that involved um, uh, putting a, a, a thin paste on the document and then laying a, a silk linen fabric over the document that would essentially get glued to it and naturally provide a protection layer. And the, the whole process was transparent so you could see everything through the document, but it provided a, a great preservation of the document. But unfortunately, this whole process of wetting the document with the paste and then pressing this linen and they used like 400 pounds of pressure to squeeze it, any kind of indentations were lost uh, to that process. So that was unfortunate. And oh, by the way, the inks that they used back in the day were carbon-based inks, so they didn't bleed under, um, under the wetness of this process. So that, that was kind of interesting. So on, on he went, my father, to look for the more classical um, techniques of, of examining his signature. And so he had prepared in advance actually some overlay transparencies, because remember this is in the 1960s, so we didn't have computer imaging or anything like that, but he had prepared transparencies of the dry stamp signature of the king. And so he was able to overlay these transparencies on the question signatures at the top of your screen, and as well as the ones that were drawn by hand. And you know you could pretty readily see if these were essentially what would look like a tracing because you know with the dry stamp method, it was very much like a tracing. And he found the overlay was virtually perfect, uh, indicating that they were in fact dry stamp. And when he looked at the preponderance of the other hand-drawn signatures, there was significant variations. You know, there was virtually none that, that were even close to the transparency. And so taking all these factors in mind, um, and, and looking at the, all the examples of the other dry stamp signatures, uh, his uh, pretty decisive conclusion was that indeed it was a dry stamp signature, which raises the question of did the king actually approve of it at that time? Um, there, there was no uh, legal outcome to be had from this. It was merely of historical interest, but uh, the conclusion was, yes, King Henry VIII did not actually sign his final will. Okay, next case I'd like to touch on, or actually it turns out to be a pair of cases. And it involves um, some cases surrounding the great Howard Hughes. Now, many of us on this call are of age, shall we say, that we actually know that name Howard Hughes. I teach this class at the Bedford High School every year. And so I'm talking to uh, junior and senior high school students and, it's the pretty rare one that unfortunately knows the name Howard Hughes. Today, we would know someone like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or um, um, folks like that as being the wealthy people. But we know back in the uh, 70s and 60s, Howard Hughes was a very notable figure, uh, one of the richest men in the world. He had so many ventures from his aircraft business, 
uh, aviation. He produced movies. He was a philanthropist. The Hughes Medical Center remains to this day out in California uh, that he founded. And so he was, he was quite a character. But uh, as many of us know, later in life, he became very um, eccentric, reclusive, uh, squirreled away in his private suites in the penthouse of a Las Vegas hotel that he owned, and virtually nobody saw him. He had just a couple trusted aides that would um, bring him his food and his documents and whatever, and he made them like sanitize, and he was a germaphobe and, and all this. So for many years, sadly, at the end of his life, he was really completely out of the public eye. I mean, completely. Even if you wanted, had an official business with him, there was just no reaching him. So, <laughs> and if I transition the picture here a little bit. You know, he's a little like Tony Stark of the, um, of the uh, movies where uh, he was a bit of an eccentric guy working on his special projects in, in hiding. Okay, so in January of 1971, Hughes was still alive at this time. There was a, a fellow by the name of Clifford Irving, and he was a noted writer. I think he had some best-selling uh, books on the market at that time. And he contacted the publisher McGraw-Hill in New York City saying, hey, Howard Hughes has been impressed with my writing, my books, and contacted me because he wanted me to write his autobiography. And at the time, um, Howard Hughes was a, a sensational character, and any publisher would be very much pleased to have a book out about the life and times of Howard Hughes. It would surely be a bestseller, make them a lot of money. And so here's this guy, Clifford Irving, who was also a noted author, uh, saying that he, he had the rights to do that, and he had a personal in with the reclusive Howard Hughes. So McGraw-Hill bit at the chance, and they began making uh, down payment, retainer payments to Irving, um, to begin the process. And it was going to take a long time because Irving had to write and he had to meet with Hughes, which was very difficult. Apparently, some of these meetings had to happen overseas in island countries like Fiji. And um, he ended up getting uh, more than $750,000 out of McGraw-Hill to help fund the development of this, of this book in a, over a one and a half year period. So McGraw-Hill, you can imagine, was you know chomping at the bit to see the results of this. And, and Irving... Um, of course, you know, McGraw-Hill didn't just do this on his word. Um, Clifford Irving presented letters to McGraw-Hill early on that were handwritten letters saying, uh, from Hughes, saying, I am authorizing Clifford Irving to write my autobiography. And uh, he had other documents with some of the content that supposedly Hughes had written by hand to Clifford Irving to give him insights into his biography. And, you know, McGraw-Hill had in, employed some forensic document people to look at those documents and they were declared genuine. So they had proceeded ahead. Well, towards the end of this time, um, it was beginning to get a little sketchy and McGraw-Hill had their doubts. And even though they had previously had some experts uh, who were my uh, colleagues of my father, by the way, and, and well-respected colleagues, they, uh, they wanted to get another opinion. And so they, they called in Donald from Milwaukee and said, can you fly out here tomorrow? Which back in you know 71 was not a, a typical thing that people jumped on a plane the next day. So I, I vaguely remember that of my father bustling off to the airport and flying to New York because they wouldn't let the documents be sent anywhere. He'd have to examine them in person. And so, um, so yeah, my father flew out to New York City to take a look at, uh, at these uh, writings that Clifford Irving had produced. Well, you're of course seeing here on this slide a little bit of the outcome of all this, um, that uh, Irving um, had an illustrious ending here. But about the document, um, you know, when somebody is going to forge somebody else's writing, an important thing is you need to know what their writing looks like. And he couldn't exactly go to Howard Hughes and say, hey, can you provide me examples? So Clifford Irving needed to find an open source of Hughes's writing. And he found that in something called the Dear Chester and Bill letter, which is shown here, at least one page of it. And this letter was was uh, genuinely written by Hughes to uh, two of his uh, trusted associates, Chester and Bill. They were like 
you know, Rudy is to Donald Trump. They were his trusted advisors and lawyers and they would do stuff for him. So he wrote this letter to the two of them and it appeared in the December issue of Life Magazine. So anyone could look at it. Uh, I don't know that it was anything highly controversial in this letter, but um, it provided a great example to anyone who wanted to forge Hughes's writing. But interestingly, and this became very important for anyone in the forensic document work, there, there were certain letters missing from this letter, it's specifically 13 capital letters, and I think maybe five lowercase letters didn't appear in this particular document. And so if, um, if, if somebody was trying to forge a document and needed to use those letters, they were, they were in a little bit of trouble. They'd have to make something up or, um, or just try to avoid using those letters. And so uh, sure enough, there, there did need to be some of these letters used in the documents. And um, the forger, and you, you rarely can determine who the forger is. Uh, we don't know that it was Clifford Irving who did the forging himself. It could have been somebody else. But uh, the forger made some mistakes on some of the characters, and they did not look right. In addition, the usual kind of stuff, regardless of this source material and the lack of certain letters, could be used to look for things like, as you can see at the top here, the, the little hook that um, Hughes used when he was writing an O. See, here's a hook here, here's a hook there that begins the letter. Over here, the question document just begins with a downstroke and there's no hook. Um, and uh, similarly here, uh, the A of and has this little looping thing going through it, uh, which does not typically appear in Hughes's writing and so on. Um, and again, the K, the uh, Hughes would do an upstroke on a K as he began it. And over here, it just begins with a downstroke. So those are all clues. No one of, of this sort of thing typically says, oh, forgery conclusively. But when you look at the preponderance of the evidence, you can uh, make a conclusion. So needless to say, um, my father, uh, within a, a day and a half or so, made a, a decision known to McGraw-Hill that he felt that it was, while a very good one, it was a forgery. And um, that was enough for McGraw-Hill to pull the plug on Clifford Irving and the rest is history. Eventually Clifford actually pleaded guilty in court and he wrote a book uh, a few years later, even documenting the techniques he used and how he created the forgery. So there was kind of really no question that he did it. Uh, he admitted it and pled guilty and spent some time in prison as well. So that was an interesting case, um, but not the end of the Howard Hughes saga, because we now go to part two, because at this point uh, in 1976, Hughes passes away. So he dies and the big question here we are with wills again like king henry the eighth like where's his will <laughs> and at first it appeared that there was no will from howard hughes he was eccentric enough i mean go figure that somebody with all that money wouldn't have left a will uh and a, no surprise uh, a dozen or more wills started to appear from left and right most of them were tossed out very quickly because they were obvious fakes but one will in particular gained quite strong attention and, um, and national, uh, national media started covering it. And it became known as the Mormon will. And it became known as this because um, it left uh, a significant amount of money to the Mormon church um, and uh, as well as other beneficiaries. I think, I forget the total number, but there was over 10 beneficiaries named the Mormon church Boy Scouts of America, the city of Los Angeles to take care of his precious airplane, the Spruce Goose, which was this enormous aircraft that, um, that he piloted, um, and other concerns, all of whom naturally brought in lawyers of their own to say, oh yes, this must be a genuine will. Um, but notably, there was one person in the will, um, someone by the name of Melvin Dumar of Gabs, Nevada, who was left 1 16th of the estate of Howard Hughes, along with the Boy Scouts got 1 16th. So this was a pretty sizable amount of money. Who is this guy, Melvin Dumar? And uh, they traced it down and he's a gas station attendant at a little podunk town on the highway uh, out of, Los, An uh, out of uh, Las Vegas. And it's like, wait a minute. And when the authorities spoke with him, 
he spun a pretty interesting tale of, um, of how, uh, how he might have come to be included in the Howard Hughes will. And his claim was that some, I don't know, a year earlier, he was driving um, on the highway and saw a man lying at the side of the road, apparently injured. He pulled over. Uh, the guy was, you know, shaggy and dirty clothes and long hair. And he put him in his truck and gave him a free ride to Las Vegas, where the man told him, I'm Howard Hughes. And you can drop me off here at this hotel because I live in the penthouse. And Melvin claims that he didn't believe the guy, but he was a good Samaritan, gave him a little bit of pocket change and was on his way. Uh, the, the man apparently got Melvin's name and later on decided to pay back the favor by giving him a 16th of his estate. There was a movie created called Melvin and Howard back in 1980. And I believe it, yeah, it won best picture of the year. I'm not sure why, but um, it was the whole story of, of this case and the story of, of Melvin and his good deed. And, and it had the trial in it. Um, and in the class I do for the high school, I actually play some segments of the movie, but that takes too long here. And um, they sadly don't feature much in the way of the uh, forensic document examiners, but that was certainly a key part of the case, uh, as you can imagine. So here are some photographs of the actual will, the, the Mormon will, which turns out, as you can no doubt not be surprised at, this was not the, a genuine will, it was a forgery. It was a, they call it a holographic will, meaning that the text of the will is all handwritten rather than typed. So you can have a will that's typed and you just sign at the bottom. This one was handwritten. And it was an okay forgery, uh, certainly not as good as the Clifford Irving work a few years earlier. But um, you can see every page was signed at the bottom, Howard R. Hughes. And, um, and the, the, there was some water damage because this document was stuffed in an envelope and the envelope had gotten wet probably by Melvin to try to make it look old or something. Um, and then he, he or somebody had dropped it uh, stealthily on the desk of a, uh, uh, a, a leader somewhere at the uh, Mormon church in uh, Salt Lake City. So it, it very mysterious how this will suddenly appears on the uh, desk of this guy. Um, but you can see there the signatures and um, and so my father was engaged along with uh, a handful of other experts on the side of the heirs to Howard Hughes, who would be the beneficiaries of his estate if there was no will. Now there were, there were experts on the other side saying it was genuine. Many of these were brought in from Europe and they were graphologists in, for the most part, uh, sort of saying, well, this displays the characteristics of Hughes' personality rather than the, the scientific method. Um, Here's uh, some examples of the um, uh, exhibit preparations that I helped prepare. Uh, I was working for dad at the time on this case. And you can see here some of the examples. Once again, we think that Melvin must have used that Life magazine letter because Hughes um, made his capital V's, for example, with this very spiky bottom, right? The very, very uh, sharp angular at the bottom. And look at the ones in the will. They were very rounded, which isn't at all a good forgery, right? You'd, you'd know enough not to make your, your Vs that way. Um, and when it came to an uppercase K, which here's some examples of Hughes's uppercase K, the forger didn't have a K. So he just took a lowercase K and kind of made it big. <laughs> so there were some pretty... Uh, egregious examples of uh, not the best forgery in the world. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, once again, like I said, the, um, the, the forger had access to some exemplars of uh, Hughes's writing, which they no doubt used. And in this case, it was, didn't necessarily have to be just the Life magazine, but a book was written about the Clifford Irving affair shown on the right, uh, the book was called Hoax. That was out by this time. And in the center of this book were a bunch of photo pages of Hughes's writing. And it became apparent that Melvin must have used this as his uh, exemplar because it also included that Dear Chester and Bill letter. And as I note here at the bottom bullet, uh, the FBI went to the um, library, I think in Salt Lake City, 
um, and found that Melvin had checked out this book some months earlier and his fingerprints were all over the middle of this book where these photo pages are. Oh yeah, and one more thing, the photographs of that Dear Chester and Bill letter on pages of that book were ripped out of the book. <laughs> so, you know, which one would do if, if you were trying to do a forgery, you could lay them on a table and, uh, and use them for your examples. So there was sort of secondary uh, incriminating evidence against Melvin there. And he claims, oh yeah, I checked it out because I was interested in Howard Hughes, but I didn't tear the pages out. Well, the most notable thing that my father found, and he was the only expert to bring this forward, was that the signature on the first page of the will, I'll go back to that, at the bottom of the page, as he testified during the trial to the uh, amazement of the jury and those present, was that this signature at the bottom of page one was a tracing. <laughs> wow, you know, that's, that's kind of the spike in the coffin of the case if you show something is actually traced. And what he was able to show is that this signature and a signature of Howard Hughes from that book that I just showed you overlaid perfectly on each other. And my father was the last one to testify on the side of the, you know, no, it's a forgery side. And uh, that was kind of the end of the case um, because not much more what could be said at that point once you show it's a tracing. So that was a fascinating case. Um, and again, the second one involving, uh, involving Howard Hughes. So I'd like to leave a little time open for questions at the end in another 10 minutes or so. So I'm just gonna spin through uh, a, a few things that, uh, you know, that I learned as a young apprentice working for my father in his office. He would give me cases and ask for my opinions on them. But of course, a lot of what I did was photography and working in the dark room and, and things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, what, uh, what he showed me is some of the techniques that document examiners will use to look for the characteristics of forgery. Uh, what are the norm? You know, there are variations. People's signatures vary from moment to moment, you know, document to document, and they vary certainly over a lifetime. And so, generally, one important thing is when you're asking for the examples of known signatures or known handwriting, you want it to be contemporaneous, meaning around the same time as the question document. You don't want to one thing that's 10 years old and then you're trying to look at a, a signature or some writings from current day. Um, when a, a forger is forging, usually, usually you see things like blunt beginnings and endings. They very deliberately put the pen down and, and very deliberately lift it. It's a little bit hard to develop that natural flow unless you're a quite accomplished forger or just have a knack for it. Uh, trem tremors or shakiness in the writing, which again, the evidence of somebody being very careful trying to shape their strokes. Now, if the pe person is elderly or has some illness, that could cause tremors as well. So you all have to take all that stuff into account. Um, and pressure clues, which you can be discerned by using side lighting to examine on the back side of the document how, how much um, pressure was used on the strokes. Um, and of course, you know, there's an interesting element, just where are you going to find examples of the person's uh, proper writing, especially if it's in the case of King Henry VIII going back hundreds of years. But usually attorneys can request things like canceled checks and other legal documents that the person has signed. But it's not just about writing and signatures. A number of other things fall into this field, like paper tears, you know, matching up the uh, the components of a paper tear, uh, tear along an envelope. My father had a case where a, a man in prison claimed that he was getting threatening, you know, murder threatening letters from somebody. And he produced a, a letter and an envelope that had the fellow's return address on it. And it had all this threatening stuff in it. <laughs> it turned out that the, the torn open envelope, the little triangle flap that had the, the return address on the back side, um, the tears did not match the rest of the envelope on the front side. So it's clear the guy must have steamed off that little triangle from something else, put it on trying to incriminate this person that was sending the letters. Uh, erasures, things like whiting out or erasing um, content from a document can be um, uh, uncovered through various pho photographic techniques, infrared photography, backlighting, infrared luminescence can make inks light up in different um, colors and so on. And even burn documents. 
Now, sometimes my father would use the local police or FBI labs to assist because they had more sophisticated laboratory facilities than he would have in his own office. But um, this whole field of, of uh, forensic document analysis is not just limited to handwriting. And of course, I haven't mentioned it, but it also applies to typewriting as well, since certainly older typewriters, not so much the modern laser printers we have today, uh, would leave a signature. You know, the, the uh, spacing and positioning and formation of the letters was not perfect as you went from typewriter to typewriter. So each one has it, had a, its own signature to it. Um, again, other interesting techniques I learned in the laboratory photo micro, uh, micrography, where you just simply a high magnification of documents, side lighting, um, and so on, which can be very interesting. In the lower left, here's, here's how an infrared photography can actually show up different inks that were used. So somebody took a document and then used another pen to write something else on it, maybe changing the amount or, the, or who it was written to. Um, and yet it could be shown that these were um, different inks that were used. And by the way, um, inks that are sold today, e even going back into the 60s, are tagged with a chemical marker to give them a date. So if you pick up a big ballpoint pen, um, it can be discerned what year that that ink was, um, was put in the pen. Um, it's granular to the year, and but what that'll tell you is if you have a document that says it was signed in 1956, but the ink wasn't even made until 1971, uh, we have a problem. So, all right. Well, that is a quick spin through of some notable cases that uh, my father uh, had, and uh, and uh, many of them are discussed in the book. Um, but now, now that we have a little bit of remaining time in the Lyceum, I would love to hear if anyone has any questions. I don't know what our typical forum for this is, but you could certainly type any questions you have in the chat box and uh, Larry and others could probably let me know about them. And um, I think it would probably also work if somebody wants to raise their hand within the Zoom tool, there is a, a button you can find that would say raise hand and then we can see it. Or you can wave frantically and we'll, uh, we'll look for you and uh, see if we can call on you that way. So let's see, Dot Bergen, is that you waving your hand? I see a, a wave there. So Dot, you will have to um, unmute yourself. Every, everybody is muted right now. So if you do want to speak, just raise your hand and then unmute yourself. Am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Okay. Well, all this business about um, voter registration, and it must be awfully tough trying to match people's signatures, you know, down in Georgia. And you're right. I sometimes sign my name with, with doing an R in the two different ways you can make an R. <laughs> it depends <laughs> on my mood of the moment. So I might have... my, my my validation might not have passed if I had mismatched those signatures, but it must have been awfully a, a terrible job to try to match those signatures in a short period of time. I yes, I you know you're you're absolutely right. Having the you know modest knowledge that I have, uh, my father would certainly have more to say on this topic. But um, it, it strikes me as a really very challenging thing to do. When my father would do a case, he would have dozens and dozens of example writings from somebody. And indeed, if people made different signatures, he'd probably see the fact that they make it in two different ways. Um, and he would spend considerable time on a case, usually weeks. Um, he might render a, a first impression within his first day, but it wasn't something where you can just imagine with thousands of ballots coming through, you know, and, and these people are not trained document examiners. So, um, I am very sympathetic and, and it clearly it would be an imprecise job to expect poll workers, uh, regardless, I'm sure they have training on this, um, but it, you know, it's not a lifetime of training and it's not a, a university level education. Um, so they are definitely being called upon to make some, um, some quick judgments. But you know, with, with something like voter fraud and trying to uh, illicitly sign voter ballots or whatever, you're, you're also not going to have somebody who's rising to the level of an expert forger either. It's going to be crude and chances are they don't have any idea what the voter's real signature looks like. That just 
takes too much work. Like, why bother? You know, you're just trying to stuff the ballot with thousands of votes. You don't really have the time to go researching what these signatures look like and, and how would you even get that anyway? So I think the threat model is, is at a very, very low bar. You know, you, the most likely situation is you have a forger who has a name, just the name typewritten, and they just make up a signature for the name and, and say, okay, there's, there's the vote ballot. Cause you know, you're not trying to do one, two, three, four illicit votes. You're trying to do thousands. Uh, and even if you have an army of people working on it, you got to crank them out quickly. And so it, they're probably going to be very poor matches for the genuine signature. But I, I am sympathetic that it's, I, I just uh, can't imagine now <laughs> what kind of job that might be to, to validate those signatures on a large scale like that, especially with only one example. All right, anyone else? Again, uh, wave your hands or raise your hand in the Zoom window. I'm just scanning here through to see if any other. In the chat there, are, um, Michelle Rosen had a comment. Yes, I'm reading it now. Um, yeah, so uh, Michelle asks about so-called electronic screen signatures where you're, I mean, we've maybe done it at the grocery store or the <laughs> Home Depot where you use your finger on a, on a touchpad to sign. And those render an extremely poor example of your signature. Um, I mean, not even close to the level of, of something that would be able to be used by a forensic document examiner to determine genuineness. I mean, at, at best you'd get like I was saying, if somebody was just had no clue about what a, a genuine signature looked like and had a name on a credit card, but no example of a signature, you might see one of those electronic pads showing you something that gives you pause. But um, I've always felt with those systems, um, it's more about the perception of security than real security. In other words, uh, you know, somebody trying to uh, do something illicit with a credit card might be a little loath to try to put their finger on something and and uh, sign. Uh, so it might make them feel a little bit more of a higher bar of, of threat. But in terms of it being a useful thing to evaluate uh, the authenticity of a signature, very tough. Now, if you use a stylus or a pen on a high quality electronic pad, I'm sure it can get a lot better. But unfortunately, you're going to lose things like pressure. Um, and, and other nuances that you would see with a pen and ink. Again, you know, if you keep stepping up, I'm sure it, you know, maybe some government facility, if they actually would use a stylus-based uh, pen sign-in, they probably have a very sophisticated electronic pad with high resolution and maybe the ability to detect pressure. So, but the grocery store or the, uh, this was, Michelle's question was about at the, uh, driver's license, the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, they're not going to have anything like that. So yeah, it's going to be a fairly um, crude signature and not all that useful for forensic document work. Um, okay, so Craig Jackson. You... Anyway, I just wanted to mention that even with uh, laser printers, all laser printers have a fingerprint. Yes, so a good point. And um, you know, my father was tailing off on his career in the uh, early 90s, I guess I would say. He worked long past, you know, 65 years old. But, um, you know, we were in the era of computers and inkjet printers, laser printers. Even in his day, he saw the arrival of, do you all remember the IBM Selectric typewriter? The IBM Selectric had the ball on it. And with the old fashioned typewriters with the, the, you know, the arms with the letters on them, if you fat fingered two keys, they'd hit together and it might make a little bend in the character. And so this gave typewriters a very unique signature. I mean, any typewriter that had lived for a year or more had very decisive marks in the typing, you know, a bent tail on a cue or whatever that you could say, oh my gosh, you know, this is a very bold signature, much like probably our hands have scars on them from our life that we've spent, right? Uh, the Selectric was rough because that ball, you could never hit anything with it. But what it did have is the letter um, spacing and the up and down, it would, it would vary slightly under very precise examination. 
Um, so even Selectric typewriters had a little bit of, of character to them, not as good as the good old fashioned typewriter. And as, as uh, Craig is noting, computers, whether they be inkjet printers or laser printers, can also have a signature. I, I haven't studied this and that, that whole era kind of was past the time when my father was, was active. So uh, I haven't followed it. I, I'm sure there probably is a way to discern some level of signatures. Is it, given that there's you know, millions and millions of printers in the world everywhere, um, you know, while you could probably discern millions and millions of human handwritten signatures from each other and, and typewriters from each other, old fashioned, with laser printers, I wonder <laughs> if there's enough variation there that you could conclusively say this one printer did the job unless it had some aberration to it. But maybe Craig knows more, or others know more. Um, I wanna get to other questions here, so let's see. George, um, you're up next. George, yes, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Um, let, me, let me make sure that Carol, it, she's I muted. All right. Um, I am involved in something that involves signature fraud right now. Um, my personal data has been compromised. I'm a victim of identity theft. Um, at least four loan and credit accounts opened. And it's actually interesting, one of them, um, Citibank. They, they sent me a, you know, a, a letter about uh, my claim of fraud. And they said, well, we're sorry, but you know, the signature matches. So you know, we're, we're rejecting your claim. Well, mm -hmm. I looked at what they sent. And first of all, the first name is only three letters. Mine is six letters. The, the second name is completely different and the signature is just a, a scrawl. So, you know, I'm in the process of trying to get a hold of them and saying, look, I'm going to send you, you know, copies of my actual signature. Um, fortunately, I have LifeLock on my um, Norton system, my security system, and, and they go to bat for you and they, they do a lot of it. So at least all of these accounts yeah. have been uh, identified on the three major, you know, um, credit um, um, bureaus as, yeah. as fraud. Well, George, but you know, this is a, a classic case of, um, of course, you know, the, the company on the other side would rather have this thing go away and not be liable. Um, but this is where attorneys get called in and ultimately potentially expert witnesses. So, you know, this could be a case, but if, you know, you have to use your own judgment about the expense and who's paying for it and all that. But uh, an expert document person, and there are you know, some good ones here in Boston, could look at this on your behalf and, um, and make an expert witness ruling. And, and, you know, oftentimes, my father rarely went into court to trials on these things. Uh, many, many times it would be settled. Once, once an expert witness is given a, an opinion, if they're a reputable document person, that's usually the end of at least that issue in the case. So if it was about a signature, um, you know, you could potentially get a, a quick uh, support on your position uh, from somebody in that field. But, you know, it's the whole world of, of lawyers and uh, <laughs> who's going to pay and all that. Maybe LifeLock will cover some of this stuff. I want to get to any yeah. other questions here quickly. Karen um, Anderson has is next. All right, Karen, go ahead. Yeah. You may have to unmute. I think I'm good. Yes. Yep. Now I hear you. We have two questions. Uh, Shannon wants to know how documents that have been damaged, what techniques are used, like if they've, they've been in a fire or some type of damage, if there's certain techniques that can be used. My question is, did your dad work with Albert Osborne? <laughs> that's, that's great. I'll, let me do the second one first. So Albert Osborne was uh, really a, a very notable figure in this field nationally known um, as one of the premier examiners, uh, well-respected, my father knew him very well. And in fact, um, in the last year of my father's life in 2004 or five, um, this society that he was a member of, the uh, Society of Question Document Examiners, uh, gave out an award every year called the Albert S. Osborne Award. And it was awarded to my father for his service over the years. 
uh, sadly, it was a, the committee made the decision, and my father knew about the decision, but then he passed away, and the award was given in Montreal, Canada, posthumously, and my mother, my sister, and myself flew up to Montreal and accepted it on behalf of dad. So that was really touching, um, that that ceremony and all the, the people there at the convention at the time that spoke with us, it was really, really, really something to hear. So yes, he, he knew Albert Osborne very well. Um, back to your first question, um, you know, depending on the type of damage, water damage, burn, charred document, um, alterations, we talked earlier about uh, erasures and things, different techniques are used for charred document. There's a, a fumigation technique where a a certain chemical vapor can be put on that actually makes the the writing pop. I mean, school kids can actually do this, you know, with vinegar and things like that to have secret writing. So it's amazing. Sometimes what looks like a hopelessly charred document, you can actually uh, restore the text on it. Um, in many cases, Dad would use outside labs for this, like the FBI or the police, because they, you know, this is something they de dealt with a lot more often. Most of my father's cases involved writing and signatures. Um, um, so we did a lot of photography because you had to prepare examples to show to the attorneys and to the, the, the trial judge or, or jury. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating area, all these different document alteration things. All right, uh, any other questions in line? Ron, here? Ron Green was uh, waving. There he is. All right, Ron, go ahead. Hey, how are you? Can you hear me? Yep. Well, what, whatever led you away from an interesting, fascinating, uh, obviously, well rewarding career uh, that you started out in. It was a couple of years as an apprentice. Was that well, I see my, my brother is on the call as well. And, and he he made the uh, the horrible decision first to step away from dad's work. Uh, I should probably make him um, uh, talk, but uh, but seriously, I, I um, you know, I, I found it really interesting. What I did not care for was lawyers and and uh, courts and judges and having to stand up in a, a in a box to tell the jurors what I thought that was horrifying to me when I was in college. Um, I've gotten more comfortable, I guess, since then with public speaking. But you know, I even from a young age, I was always a geek. I was building things and electronics and all that stuff. So really, electronics and ultimately computers and internet and all that became my passion and and. It just was what I wanted to do. So um, I guess I always knew that I could jump back to that career early in my days when dad was still working if I wanted to. And same with my brother, who is now a minister out in Cadillac, Michigan. Um, but uh, yeah, our, our desires just pulled us elsewhere. And, and to dad's credit, he never put any serious pressure on us to follow in his footsteps. Although I, I know he would have loved to see the business and the name continue in Milwaukee. Ellen, then Peter, then Craig, if we have time. All right, Ellen. Hi, I had a question about DocuSign. It's kind of a, an ad adjunct to the earlier discussion, um, but people are probably very familiar with this software where you sign uh, and it then takes your name and then follows up throughout the rest of the document and just puts your name there in, in a script font, but not yes. your actual signature. Yes. Um, and that's, I wasn't sure, is it similar to what you said before on the pin pads where it's just kind of a, it doesn't have legal stance or? Right, I mean, DocuSign and, and there's many other tools that we use these days on the internet or our computers or our, our phones, or even like I said, at Home Depot with your finger on a pad, where the, the import, the importance of your signature being traceable biometrically to you as a person is far diminished. And clearly docu, DocuSign is, is the extreme of that. I mean, it's, it's almost meaningless, right? Because it's not your signature. And even if you provided something on the, with your mouse on the screen, it's pathetic, right? So, um, so these things are, are simply, in my view, you know, I'll take all this as, you know, I'm not an expert in this field, although I am in the field of computer security, but this isn't my specialty. But the, the, the people who's, you know, whether it's the IRS for your tax return or whatever, 
who are getting this document so-called signed by you have made a decision that it's more important to get things done quickly and electronically versus processing all that paper um, and mail and all that stuff. It's more important than having an authentic uh, traceable signature. And they're relying on other things like um, your internet IP address, the, the fact that they probably can trace where this came from. Now, it, I mean, somebody could say, I wasn't there at the time, you know, somebody broke into my house and sent that. So, you know, legally, the, the chain of trust is not very intact with these kind of systems. But the person who cares, the IRS or your bank or whatever, have just made the decision that they're okay with that. It's a little like credit cards, right? You know, th there's a lot of credit card fraud that goes on and the credit card companies just eat it. They've decided it's 2% of our profits and we make 10% on, you know, the business we do. So we'll just shrug our shoulders and let it go. Peter. Peter Ash. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, but I, I would yield to Carol because her question sounds more interesting than me, mine. We both posted our questions to chat. So why don't you go ahead, Carol? I'm uh, looking in the chat. Uh, da, da, da. Is this from Carol Hamilton? Yes. Oh, Carol Hamilton has a funny story about forgery at First Parish. Oh, you'll Carol, love it. you're unmuted. Uh, you'll love this, Bob. In the late 90s, uh, birthday cards were sent out from the office, uh, signed uh, maybe primarily staff people, maybe all staff people. And um, one of the people in the office said, oh, Carol, I signed your name to these cards. And I said, oh, you did? How do you have my signature? She said, well, here it came with your on your check or something. Endorsement and on the, check. Uh, the endorsement on the check, on my paycheck. And <laughs> the funny thing was that was Peter forging my name <laughs> on the check that then <clears throat> Lindy took and wrote in the card. That is too funny. <laughs> a forgery of a forgery. <laughs> yes, exactly. well, nice. <laughs> Thanks, Peter Ash. <laughs> All right, Peter, back to you. Um, Okay, uh, yeah, well, it was just uh, uh, a movie that I saw. I wondered if you had seen it called The Lives of Others. And it, it, uh, it's about uh, uh, the, it takes place in the uh, East German dictatorship and somebody smuggles uh, a letter. Uh, um, I guess it's been written by a dead man or something. So the, uh, he, he he gets it out somehow to uh, to to the West. A spy in the West takes photographs of the letter and uh, with with a with a good camera and sends it back to the Stasi, and that tells them what typewriter was used. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so, it, it, uh, it's, uh, 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 by the way, anybody. I recommend the, the movie highly. It's one of the best movies I've ever seen. That's great. Thank you. I have not seen it, um, but it makes me want to check it out. And indeed, in that era, in the World War II times, um, for sure, we would have been talking about the old typewriters and their very definite signatures and a, a good quality photograph of some typewriting. If you had access to the original typewriter or its you know other documents produced by it, you'd be able to make a, a match. Um, one of the early cases, dad was um, apprenticing at the time, but he worked on the Lindbergh baby kidnapping case. And um, ransom notes to the Lindbergh family for the baby were typed on a Woodstock typewriter. And that typewriter was found in a barn attic of, if I recall, a, a helper on, on their property who lived up in this attic and the, the police or the FBI found this typewriter up there and were able to match it to the, um, to the ransom notes. So uh, there was other evidence as well, but uh, that was very much a typewriter case for the Lindbergh baby. Sadly, that baby died and was not, uh, you know, was not recovered in time. Any other questions in line here? If somebody could help me who might be next up. Carla Bradford. It 
Hi, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, so um, about a year and a half ago, my three siblings and I were um, involved in selling our late mother's condo. Um, and so there were four of us, we were each getting a quarter of it. And I was a little concerned that all of, we were, and we're all in different places, all right? And um, I was a little concerned that the documents that we were getting for the sale were asking us to just sign them electronically. Mm -hmm. And like you said, Bob, that, you know, if it's a pin pad, it, they're not going to try and match your signature to that because it's all pixelated and whatever. Yeah. But this was, these are legal documents that were selling, you know, selling a building. And I was, I, I, I'm assuming that even though that was computer and it wasn't, it wasn't even a stylus. All we had to do was write I that it was, uh, write our names, yeah. you know, type our names. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but I mean, it all worked out. We all got our money and stuff, but I was just like, this is weird. Yeah. I, I mean, I understand that the four of us are in four different places. And so it's easier for them to do it this way than us all traipsing into Connecticut to, you know, but I was like, wow, I'm really, I really yeah. hope this is legal. <laughs> well, it, it just goes back to what I was saying. There's, there's always a balance. I, I am very much in the field of computer security and you know, it's all about a, a scales tipping between the most secure and the most usable. And decisions have been made in recent years, decades, that um, avoiding sending paper around and the delays that that causes and the other issues with, you know, oh, it got lost in the mail and your closing has been delayed. Yeah. Doing things electronically is just so appealing that the interested parties, in broad quotes, have decided they're they're okay with a much weaker chain of trust. So yes, these signatures are on the verge of kind of worthless. You know, uh, about all what one can say is that you had some intent when you typed your name into that box, but how can even that be proved? And other than again going back to records of IP addresses, which are not the most you know traceable things anyway in terms of you know history, IP addresses can change over time. They're not permanent. Um, so, you know, and, and I think the banks and others are using other mechanisms besides just the signature. Um, maybe they, they send you a conf confirmation email and then you're expected to say, wait a minute, I'm not selling a house. What are you talking about? And things like that. So there, there are other ways to kind of validate that there was the true intent of the party. But as, you know, George noted and others perhaps with having identity theft, it can become very insidious and um, all the more reason to be checking, you know, your statements and watch your email for bank confirmations that some transaction has happened that you know nothing about. <laughs> um, because, yeah, the days of using signatures for a lot of things is, is definitely fading with the advent of computers. Now, we all know about biometrics, things like your fingerprint. My laptop here has a fingerprint scanner to unlock it. Um, and I'm in the field of cryptography, which is, you know, codes and ciphers and things like that. And we have very strong tools that are, frankly, far more secure than any signature could ever be in terms of cryptographic ways to authenticate. Um, there's something called digital signatures, which can take an entire document, say a will, and um, essentially scan it in. Every character, every space, every uppercase, lowercase gets smashed into a thing and then a digital signature is applied and if somebody tampers with one period or one space in that document the signature will fail so we have very good ways of doing digital signatures on things but they still require tracing back to somebody who authorized that signature so chain of trust so to speak all right any other questions in line i know we're getting late on uh, those that want to stay on but uh Ellen, what do you think? Yeah, I think we can close there unless somebody is frantically um, raising their hand. Let's just see. Craig, did you Ellen. still have a question or a comment? I saw your hand was raised before. I don't see him on right now. Okay. Anything, anybody else, Larry? I don't see anyone. Yeah, I don't see anything else. So I'll just remind you all that uh, if you're interested to hear more, and there's over a dozen cases in, in this book here, uh, Witness to Forgery on Amazon. Um, you know, it's a, 
I, I was going to talk to the Bedford Library and make sure they had a copy of it. It's certainly not on the bestseller list, but uh, <laughs> it's a fun little read if, if this whole topic interests you. Thank you so much, Bob. I was wondering if you could flip to the final slides um, just for me. You bet. Um, one or two there. I just wanted to let people know about some upcoming um, Lyceum. We, we're trying to have one a month. So on February 21st, all these are Sundays, we're going to have a talk and reading by one of our local poets, um, Joyce Pesseroff. Um, there is an article in the Bedford Citizen recently about her work. Um, and then on March 14th, in honor of uh, recognition of Women's History Month, um, our own uh, uh, Ben Sears is going to be talking about Mary Baker Eddy and uh, some of her legacy, um, especially here in New England. Um, and next slide, please. So we just wanted to thank Larry and Bob for their assistance. Um, and the final slide, if people are interested in supporting uh, this free um, series through the UU Bedford First Parish in Bedford, there are ways that you can make a donation should you care to. And um, it's of course not mandatory in any way and pre-registration to these events is not necessary. So we look forward to um, the February event. And if you have any comments or questions or ideas, if you could go back one more slide just for a second. Um, I'm sorry, two more slides. <laughs> Um, my email address is mountainbreeze52 at gmail.com, and we'd love to hear ideas from, from people who have attended um, so we can enhance the, just the presentations and bring more interesting things over time. And thank you so much, Bob. This is fascinating. Well, thanks for having me. Our best. Thank you, everyone.